Uh, this is the OGM weekly call on Thursday, July 6th, 2023. Um, we uh, Today, our format is uh, five minute universities. So we're going to um, see what we got in that realm. I know I, uh, I know several that want to present and I'm hoping other people would like to jump in as well. I've got a timer on hand and uh, we will see how this runs. But before we do that, how is everybody? Where is everybody? Well, as we said, here I am in Montenegro still. Uh, the weather is pretty good, but beginning to heat up. Yep. And I've learned that the rich understand climate change and they say, but so what? Just let me spend my money the way I want. Don't tax it and don't do any fancy projects and take it away. Yep. It's a Rushkoff's, is it Rushkoff's latest book? The the billionaires on the bus or whatever? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. He was pointing, pointing, pointing that out. Hey, Mike. Hey, Pete. Hey, Ken. Hey, Hank. How's everybody? Glad to be here. Had a three or four day weekend. Can't complain. Nice. Excellent. Where are you now, Mike? I am sitting in my house in Arlington, Virginia. Oh, fabulous. Excellent. Come I, and visit. Come and if, visit. If but not now. It's uh, ugly. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty um, hot where you are, too, isn't it? It, we had a little spike a couple of days ago at like 97 and it's going to level off. And then I've got some travel coming up. Um, it always blows my mind that when the civil war starts, you can look across at Lee's plantation. You can look across the Potomac at where Lee's plantation was. Mm -hmm. And, and, and that, that, that's like the, they were the, the enemy headquarters were that close to each other in some sense, although Richmond winds up being the HQ, but uh, that was crazy. And and when Lincoln gets arrives in DC to get inaugurated, there's nobody there to protect him. There are no troops. Nobody nobody's mm -hmm. like yeah whatever. And mm -hmm. he has to call in some a Pennsylvania regiment to basically come and defend the city in case in case Confederates organize themselves and decide to come take over the capital. Well, they they kept the Confederates at least 30, 40 miles away. Yeah, what's thirty? So the, miles? the first battle of Bull Run was, you know, that was thirty miles, twenty miles out of town. All the Washingtonians got in their carriages and went out there to watch the war, because mm -hmm. that's what you would do. It was a spectator sport. It was like NASCAR. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, without the bleachers, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 without, and without and without the corporate logos. Yeah, and that too. Oh no, no! Each state had its logo. Oh, that's true. It was it was all about advertising how brave your state was. Everybody. I, I often okay. feel that way about spectator sports as we see the reports of wars in various parts of the country. It's <laughs> yeah, it's still that. Yeah. Yeah. More parts of the world. Yeah. We're still at it. Mm -hmm. They cool. seeded the Virginia part back like because it was a 10 mile square, but they tried to <laughs> tried to get keep Virginia from Going, but ended up being Arlington National Cemetery and National Airport and the Pentagon <laughs> it was basically that space anyway. Yep. They have a brand new monument at the Amazon headquarters, which is just south of the Pentagon. And it's actually a monument to all of the Black families that were displaced in the late 30s and early 40s when they built the Pentagon. <laughs> so there were wow. about 950 families that were just pushed out of these, you know, low low income housing, mm -hmm. and um, given very little money. It was eminent domain. You're right. out of there. But it's a quite a quite a stunning monument. It's, uh, it has mm -hmm. sort of has bricks in, with the name of each each family. Mm -hmm. Very cool. But, uh, yeah, the new Amazon headquarters is pretty pretty incredible. Even if you're just flying through Washington, you can do a one mile jaunt and go see this place. It's uh, our little bit of Silicon Valley. I hadn't heard much about it at all. Um, I've, got, uh, I've got a queue of just three uh, five minute universities set up. Uh, me, Stuart and Gil, happy to go in whatever order you guys would like to go in. And uh, I don't know who that else. That order sounds fine. That order sounds fine, sounds great. I don't know if anybody else wants to jump in or whatever, but I think, why don't we do those? 
and then see where we are. And I've got a um, speaker's talk, and I also have a, there's a couple websites where you can do a timer, but I think what I'm going to do is kind of hold this up to my clock, uh, and I will watch it while I do my talk, because I don't know how to, if anybody else wants to hold this, a timer up while we're doing it, because I'd like to, I'd like to hew to the five minutes as much as possible uh, in doing this. So the, the idea of five minute universities is to take some topic that we care about and know something about uh, and to speak about it for exactly five minutes. Uh, could be shorter, but try not to go over. And then to do Q&A for just five minutes. And I know that, you, that there's no way to exhaust the Q&As in that period. But really, the idea is to, to kick up who you want to go talk to at the copy break or later or whatever. Um, from what they just said. So, so five minutes gives us enough time to sort of expand into that space. And um, since that is our order, I think what I'll do is jump into mine. Let's find. Jerry, do you have a loud horn or should we provide that? Uh, so <laughs> we, we, sh we should all scream. <laughs> Well, actually, um, I was at I was at the BJ Fogg, and I'm forgetting who else it was. Hosted a Facebook contest at Stanford University years ago with their class, and um, this was back when you loaded apps into your Facebook profile, and mm -hmm. you know the number of app, the number of people who had loaded your app was like a, a contest at the time, and they expected the winner the winning team to maybe get ten thousand um, installs or loads. I'm forgetting what we called it of the app. I think it was installs. Um, and the winning team got like a million or more than a million installs of their app. It just blew everybody away. And the reason I tell the story is that he every team had two and a half minutes to present their pitch for what they did and describe exactly what they did. And he had a person with a glockenspiel sitting in the first row of the audience with a timer. And he gave instructions to the room, which is really well, one of the things he did as we walked in was if there's an empty seat next to you, hold your hand up. And that's a great way to pack the room, like super easy. And then he said at the two and a half minute mark, the glockenspiel will sound, everybody loud applause. And you can't talk over loud applause. Like, and, and so the speakers were like, they, they laughed and they, they were done and they, they got off stage. Uh, so we could do applause. That would work out fine if you, if you want to do that uh, or whatever. That's much more elegant. When Hunter and I were, Hunter Levitz and I were teaching at Presidio Graduate School and had the students do their, their pitches, um, with a timer on it, uh, we had a big air horn. Yeah, the air Which horn go up. The, the air horn makes it hard to be a speaker. You're like, ah, is that thing? Is that thing going to go off? What's what's going to happen? I don't want that to happen. By far the best was what uh, Bob Metcalf used to do, and Stuart Alsop at a, at Agenda. They actually gave everybody their own little um, note, a uh, little little number pad, so you could rank the speaker as they were speaking. Oh, okay. And the higher the ranking, the slower the clock. Oh, so I don't remember that at all. Wow. Right in front, right in front of the stage, <laughs> and it it actually it wasn't a major thing. It was maybe if you were an amazing speaker, you got an extra two minutes in your ten minute slot. Yeah, but it was really effective. I mean, people really cool. made sure they were saying something important with every sentence. That's awesome. I love that. I remember the days of agenda. I think I went to one or two of those, and they well, were, were kind of you were with the competing team. They, they were our competitors, but we comped each other to our conferences. So, uh, but I don't think I went to that many agendas. And also, uh, demo was back in the day. I went to a couple mm -hmm. demos. My gym bag now is my demo two thousand two bag. That was the swag from that conference. Um, cool. So I am ready. I've got my I've got my timer, which I'm going to hold up a little bit every now and then. But when I go to share screen, which I will do now. Uh, so I'm kind of ready. Uh, I'm going to go to slideshow mode. All right. Does that look reasonable for everybody? Mm -hmm. Good. So I'm going to hit the timer and, uh, and if I'm going to do this and, uh, start, this is a history of artificial intelligence and machine learning and a little bit about where we are. Back in the 40s, when the first computers were being uh, built, a lot of people were trying to figure out how do we model human thinking? It was a natural thing to do. It was one of the first things people started to try to do. 
And I'm going to overgeneralize brutally here just to tell you the story, but this split into two different paths. One group of people tried to emulate the logic of the brain. How do we reason? So if you have sniffles and cough, then you probably have the flu, except when you have the chills, then you might have malaria, et cetera, et cetera. This got pretty, uh, pretty complicated. And then a bunch of other researchers decided to model just the neurobiology, the neurochemistry of how we think, where they were modeling uh, uh, basically neurons and how neurons fire. So they get activated, they have inputs into a neuron, there's a threshold function, and then they fire and activate other neurons downstream. Uh, and then they, these, this took a lot of matrix math. This first group were called expert systems back in the day, and this other group were known as neural networks. Um, the expert systems were interesting because you would sit a knowledge engineer down with a domain expert, they would derive these explicit rules, and this gave you a really nice audit trail because when the expert system said you have the flu, it could show you which rules had fired. Neural networks learn from big data sets. All these, this matrix math basically creates weights inside of these artificial neurons. It's very calculation intensive. Every now and then it gives you amazing results, but it left no auto trail. There's, this is a black box. It's very hard to tell, not impossible, just really hard to tell what the neural network was doing. Mm -hmm. Then in 1969, these two famous people, Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert, very big dogs in the, the machine intelligence world, write a book titled uh, Perceptrons. This book freezes almost all research into neural networks because they prove that neural networks are impossible. And what they proved mm -hmm. was that sim simple single layer neural networks were impossible because mathematically they couldn't represent enough complexity. It turns out that they are really wrong, but they managed to successfully hold off uh, research in the field for um, uh, 15 years or so. And a few people who were in the field sort of keep digging, luckily. Then we get this era of machine intelligence and uh, expert systems got better and found mainstream use, but, but neural networks started to get layers. So we, we call this deep learning because you start to get hidden layers inside the, the neural net. Uh, hardware went from just normal CPUs to graphic processing units out of graphics places. And we got some breakthrough performance in very narrow, narrow domains. And a bunch of research like convolutional neural nets, recurrent neural nets, and a variety of models were developed that got more and more complicated. Because I bear a little bit of a grudge against the expert systems people, I, I tend to think of artificial intelligence as the expert systems side of things. So for me, I think of machine intelligence as the blanket term. And machine learning, I tend to, to, to put over on deep learning. Now, this is me in the late 80s at New Science Associates uh, looking through a, a deck of uh, uh, foils, basically on acetate, about to give a speech. In 1988, I wrote this report, Neural Networks Prospects for Commercial Use. So I have a little bit of history in this field, and I love the field. The neural networks are what attracted me into technology in the first place. So machine intelligence basically um, got better, but really didn't improve as much as machine learning did, where we suddenly got gigantic data sets. The hardware got better. We went from GPUs to tensor processing units to dedicated hardware for these things. And we got breakthrough performance in broader domains. And a bunch of new language comes up. Generative <coughs> adversarial networks or GANs, large language models, transformers. GPT is the generative pre-trained transformer and latent diffusion models like stable diffusion. All this stuff is really like suddenly starts doing really great things. So um, my conclusions, this is real. Like this is, this is not blockchain. This is not 3D TV. This is not uh, a bunch of other things, the metaverse. This is actually very real and very useful. Machine learning eats tasks, not jobs, but that's interesting because you eat enough tasks and the job is in danger. So a really important question here is, are we looking to augment humans or replace them? Our future is cyborg. I am convinced that more and more we are going to be blending symbiotically with technology. Um, and there is a flourishing ecosystem of organizations trying to build all this technology, many of which are busy replacing things. Now, this is not artificial uh, uh, general intelligence. Uh, this is not uh, as smart as humans, but um, that's not a barrier to progress. Uh, this, the, all these systems are self-improving. The fusion of these different kinds of intelligence is, go is going to happen. And whether we head into a utopia or a dystopia um, matters because what we do today is going to make all the difference in the world. And I am out of five minutes, and that's the end of my presentation. So be a good cyborg is my punchline. And now we have uh, five minutes of q and I will drop my screen and take questions.
And all improvements, anything I got wrong, all improvements send me because I want this, I'm going to re-record this and I want this to be better and more accurate. So tell me how to make this better. Doug, uh, you're muted. Someday I'll learn. Uh, what strikes me is that the division between thinking and the rest of human activity is somewhat artificial. And that we made a mistake by thinking that human beings were different from other animals because of being sapient. The problem is that maybe the most interesting thing about human beings is their capacity for caring like other animals and not their capacity for thinking. So if we'd started out with, a, and this is a question I hope, if we'd started out with a model of caring of which thinking would be a subset because it would support or not support caring, but we have different kinds of models today. Um, absolutely, and and there's a whole bunch of directions we could take that in. Um, we we're, this is a very linear left brain yang kind of a scientific branch that has pursued that side of things rather than the relational side of things. The interesting thing is that neural networks are really good at mapping different kinds of relations. The bad part is that a lot of this stuff is not measurable in any particular way. Uh, Mike, Pete, Stuart, Gill. Just real quick, a great, very concise presentation. And I particularly like the fact that you didn't just say AI, AI, AI. And I, I like the machine intelligence term, uh, although I still think machine learning is the best term. So my, it's my two comments, it would be great if you um, spent a little time talking about how the financial sector is just going crazy with this stuff and making billion dollar decisions. David Brin thinks that's where the uh, killer robots will come from. But the question I have for you very quickly, what myth or misperception about machine learning would you like to just erase? You know, what, what, what's, I mean, there's a lot of people going in the wrong direction, both in government and the corporate sector. Yeah. Is there, is there some fundamental misunderstanding that you would like to get rid of? There's one easy one, which is, um, approximating human, um, like robots or, or, or um, androids that approximate human motion and dexterity and all that are, is a stupid idea. And holding holding computers up to, is it like a human? Does it think like a human? The Turing test kind of thing is, also seems like a stupid idea <clears throat> because these are different intelligences and there's lots of forms of locomotion and, and, and uh, activity. Um, so I, I think that people who say, oh, this isn't a danger because it's not as smart as a human are naive. And I think that people who are busy trying to replace us with something that looks in, like, seriously, there's the uncanny valley is the problem too. So, so that's one, one myth I'd love to dispel. It's like that this stuff is only going to be good or should be aiming to try to be like humans. Forget that. Um, Pete. Great presentation, Jerry. Uh, your top one or two uh, tips for keeping it exactly at five minutes. Uh, top tips for keeping it short, um, rehearse. Um, well, five minutes, not, not yeah. just short. You, you've nailed it. Um, it's very funny. We had a guest at, a, at an IFTF conference. Gary Wolf gave a talk about quantified self. And I was sitting right behind him. And I watched him sort of read his speech. And he came, he came to the second at the time we gave him. And I just stood up and gave him a standing ovation because of that. So that kind of influenced me a little bit way back then. Um, Stuart. Yeah. Um, so for a non, I agree with your conclusion that we're heading to a cyborg universe. I don't think there's any question about that. We don't know exactly what that means. But my question is, for a non-techie, could you give me a 20 or 30 second summary of what you said? Um, <laughs> sure. Computers are emulating, computers are able to reason whatever that means. And I'm not saying that they're conscious or intelligent or any of those loaded words, but they're able to create reasoning that is now helping us solve a whole bunch of different things. And we need to figure out how to integrate that well into our lives. Um, there's a bunch of distractions and everything else, but that's the gist of it. Thank you. Bill, Beautiful. you've got 30 seconds. Um, terrific presentation. I like what Doug said. Um, we're very confused about thinking and even the neural network model is, presumed, is based on a kind of computational model in the neurology. And we live in a, in a hormonal system, endocrine system, skeletal muscular system. Not all of our being is in thinking. And the Eastern traditions are focused on trying to quiet the thinking part of being human, uh, all of which is missing from this game. Totally agree. And I'd love to pursue that further. And we are out of questions. Me too. Um, thanks, everybody. 
send me email, whatever. Uh, I, I would love to make this a, a better presentation, but that's our first five minute you. Um, thank you. I am going to who uh, and I think we've got Stuart next. Uh, let me let me go. Hold on. Let me stop my presentation from taking over my screen. Come back to Zoom. Good. Um, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate it. Uh, I am going to start the my clock when you start speaking. And Stuart, I'm going to occasionally hold up my timer to my little window, even though are you screen sharing or are you just talking? I'm going to speak. I'm going to screen share one one not a slideshow, just one one screen. Mm -hmm. Sounds great, and that should be all set. Um, and then what, when we uh, what what kind of warning do you want, or do you want to? Will you be able to see what I'm doing? Um, I'll see. I'll I'll see what you're doing, and um, I'm pretty good with time. Okay. Sounds great. And at the I, five minute mark, I'm gonna I'm gonna make a sound like a glockenspiel, and hopefully we'll applaud. <laughs> You ready? Whenever Great. you start, whenever you, whenever yeah. you start talking, I'll hit go. And I can see you. We are seeing your document. You are fine. Great. I'll see. I see you just fine. So here we go. So um, a little bit of history. I, I wrote a book called The Book of Agreement around two thousand two. Or 2003, uh, one of its critical reviews called it more practical than getting to yes. It is also um, the foundation for the concept of conscious contracting, which is a movement in the legal profession. One of the things I noticed practicing law for 10 years was that all of the commercial work, the contracts, were what I come to call agreements for protection all the things that go wrong. And there wasn't enough focus on, so what is the joint vision of people that are trying to collaborate together going, going forward? Um, how can you kind of facilitate that? Um, so anyway, um, I put together this model for uh, ag uh, agreements for results, creating shared vision, right? And um, I used it. I tested it. The Book of Agreement contains about 35 different agreements in various um, uh, different contexts. Uh, and so I want to share with you over the next few minutes uh, the essential elements of agreements. I'll put a link to this um, uh, file uh, in the chat. Uh, and there are some expanded definitions here. So. Anytime we have collaboration, and why is collaboration critical? Because everything I've seen in terms of predicting the future talks about how essential it will be for us to work together um, when, if everything kind of collapses and we've got to rebuild, um, or if somehow miraculously we're able to um, kind of um, push back against the emerging forces that are kind of uh, bringing the species down right now. Um, so intent and vision, and this is a conversation, whether it's two, whether it's four, whether it's six, whether it's 20 people gathered, all right? What's our intent and vision? What is it that we want to accomplish? What's our vision for six months down the road, a year down the road, whatever the right time frame happens to be? Roles, who's taking responsibility to make sure that any particular uh, essential function needs to be taken care of. Whose responsibility is to make sure that that's part of the um, of the uh, 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 of the, um, uh, the of the project moving forward? By the way, project moving forward. I was on a circuit of project managers in the early two thousands, presented all over the state of California. Number three, promises. What does each person agree to actually do? to bring that vision into reality. And when everybody makes their promises, is that gonna bring that vision into reality or we do, do we need something else? Time and value. How long are we gonna be at this for? Value, more important. We all know that if people perceive they're not getting anything out, their performance kind of falls off and they don't continue. So everybody's gotta understand what their value is. Metrics, one of the great causes of conflict is people disagreeing whether or not they achieve what they set out to do. So what are the objective metrics by which they're gonna measure that? Number six, concerns and fears. 
Uh, the reason projects often fail is people don't voice their concerns and fears at the beginning. And I want people talking about that. Number seven, renegotiation. We know what we know when we begin. We don't what we don't, we don't know what we don't know. So it's real important for everyone to be able to come back and renegotiate from time to time. Consequences, I've actually changed this word. It, consequences is, is a bad. Uh, consequences really means what's at stake here? What's at stake for the individuals? What's at stake for the community they serve? What's it, uh, at stake for the broader social good? Conflict resolution, we know in the history of, uh, of projects of collaboration that conflict often arises. Difference is a good thing. When people get ego identified, conflict comes out. So it really is kind of um, critical uh, for people to have a preordained way about how they are going to deal with conflict. Obviously, I have models for that. And number 10, agreement, question mark. After you've discussed these nine elements, uh, are you in agreement? Do you have a path forward? Is there a clear shared vision? Um, and if not, there's more conversation or you can choose to walk away. There ought to be an app for this. Anybody wanna work on that? I'm very, very happy to engage. Pleasure to share this material with you. Woohoo! Wow. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Yay. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing your screen and uh, five minutes of questions. Uh, Doug. Yeah, I don't see where I am, but okay, there I am. Emery Lovins used to talk about how you could get an agreement among needs when people would disagree about vision. And it was important to keep that in mind because often all you needed was an agreement on needs on a critical, critical issue. So my question is, is, how does that fit into your model? Agreement on means a uh, promises, okay? What are the promises that each person makes? In other words, how are you gonna kind of move this forward by people actually doing stuff? That's where the means would come in, Doug. It feels though that Doug is um, trying to uh, cut through, that that advice was trying to cut through the negotiation process by separating, gosh, we don't ever, we're never gonna agree on, on what our goals are, but boy, there's a couple of things we could do together. An appreciative inquiry fits in here really nicely. So is there is there a way these, these frameworks kind of fit with each other? Beautiful. So um, in some ways, um, having an agreement with a shared vision, um, it, it's not so much about negotiation and wordsmithing, Jerry. It really is about shared vision, cumulative vision, um, everybody's vision for the future. How How is it we're going to get there? I, I have found that to be a much better way of uh, operating in this context, because otherwise you can get bogged down. Awesome. Thank you. Gil? I thought Doug said needs which is also often the case. We, we all need the same, we, we have different needs, but we can often agree that we have a common need. We just don't know how to get that fulfilled. I'm sorry, Gail, it's your turn. No, no, that's okay. That's, that's the, that I, I heard the same thing. I'm Mike. sorry. And, 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 and the other alternative to, to vision and means and needs is care. It's like, what do people care about? Because often behind all the disagreements, people have common cares, and that can be a starting point as well. That can go to means or go to vision or go to various other directions. Yeah, needs also comes up in terms of value, okay? What's the value people perceive they're getting? Because that would be the context in which they can art articulate what their needs are, all right? Uh, in terms of keeping them engaged moving forward. Love that. Um, Doug. Not me. Uh, Doug B, sorry. Doug B. I'm curious, I'm, I'm curious, Stuart, the... The essence of contract current form is, is in contemplation of breach, in contemplation of failure of commitment or obligation. And, um, and law is intrinsically about in the breaking of punishment. <laughs> so those two things go together. Taking that dimension out of the equation, what's the replacement? within the frame of agreement for punishment, for damage, for mapping to those quotients as opposed to something else? We've taken that out of the equation, <laughs> okay? <laughs> um, quote, these are not legal agreements. Um, and I, I decided to take that out of the equation completely. 
Okay, why? Because it creates, as we all know, when you get involved with lawyers negotiating agreements, it creates an adversarial context, which is the exact opposite and the antithesis of of what's intended in this in this in in, in this frame. By the way, the ten elements are a model. Like any model, you innovate. You know, it's a it's a it's an art form as you learn to work with and use these um, these elements. Thank you. Thanks. Mark. Um, can you talk about subjective measures? I mean, there's things like falling in love. There's things like, you know, uh, bonding. There's things like um, even aspects of team building or organization building that are subjective rather than objective. Beautiful. One of my, one of my favorite questions, Mark, thank you for that. Under the notion of metrics, if you take any metric, if you keep drilling down, you can turn it into something that's objective. So falling in love, okay? What would be the indicia of falling in love? Boom, 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 boom. And then you get something that's measurable. Measurable, measurable in a subjective, measurable in a subjective sense. Not everyone's going to agree, okay? But, but the parties to this particular agreement, and it's a private contract, a piece of private legislation, People get to agree on that. Dude, I'm a metrics guy and I can't disagree with you more. <laughs> we are out of time on this particular topic. Yay. Yay. Mm -hmm. Thank by the, you. By the way, I offered this work to the writing project. And I, my only hope is that you guys are doing something that's close. And I think Pete indicated that he had something that, that covered the bases in this. Okay, but I'm here anytime if you run into trouble. <laughs> Thank you, Stuart. And and we're sort of trying to run quick so that we get a quick first book. We're a little bit on hiatus right now because I have some travel coming up and Klaus has travel coming up. Uh, by the by, everybody, I got to meet Klaus in person this weekend because he was in town in Portland for a blues festival. And I came down to a, a like a pub nearby and we had a, a beer in Portland, which is what you do. Um, and, and we actually got to talk without being imprisoned by little rectangles. It was lovely. Um, so that was really terrific. Where is Klaus based these days? Bend. He lives in Bend, Oregon. Oh, okay. Neighbor. It's very, it's not yeah. only two hours. Is he, is yeah, he not... taller in person? Uh, <laughs> uh, no, he was about the height I expected, but totally get the joke. Um, all right. And we have Gil. Are you prepared? I'm just about prepared. I, I let me see if the screen sharing is going to work. Cool. Because I don't know. I'm experimenting not just with the five minutes, but with using the slide function in Obsidian. First time I've done that. So let's see okay. what happens. I've not, I've not seen this happen. This is going to be fun. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to see you. I can't can you see. Go, can you, can see? you go? Uh, we can see the thing, but yeah, there you go. Can you go full screen with it? Um, yeah. Let me see if just, I can. Yeah, little little green button. Bing. Oh, okay. And I can still see you. Um, you looks awesome. Yeah. Cool. Let's do right. it. Ready? Uh, when you start talking, I'll hit the go. Okay, I'll start talking. Um, so I want to dive into some of the wiring underneath what Stuart was talking about and talking about words and worlds and how we create worlds with our words. Uh, and this comes out of, um, as many of you know, the work I've been doing for the last 10 or 15 years with Fernando Flores and Chauncey Bell has had profound impact on me and how I work uh, in the world but also comes out of the last Living Between Worlds conversation that Ken and I host, where a couple of people were, were complaining about talk versus action. Enough talk, we need action. And it struck me that there is no action without talk. We generate ideas, possibilities, agreements, as Stuart was talking about, um, and coordinate our actions in the world through conversation. So it's fundamental to look at that. Um, some... Um, I'm going to skip the history, but uh, about, what, 70 years ago, um, um, Austin in, in the UK said they're not, they're not, that there's two different kinds of language. There's language that describes something, and there's language that creates something uh, uh, that actually has changed the social reality. Uh, and there are five that I want to talk about here. There may be others on the list, but here you see them. Uh, uh, declarations, very familiar. Uh, Wow, time goes fast. Uh, the, you know, the ref calling foul at a basketball game, the justice of the peace saying, I declare you man and wife, the Supreme Court of the United States overturning 50 years of precedent. These are speech acts that change reality by virtue of the authority of the speaker, either granted or claimed. And we all do this. There are requests and promises, and Stuart was talking about this some. Um, uh, 
uh, and offers, which are kind of a conditional promise. Competent requests have a what is it, by when is it going to happen, the conditions of satisfaction for fulfillment, and the for the sake of what, the reason behind this. And you hear the overlap with Stewart's agreements here. We instituted this at Natural Logic 15 years ago as necessary conditions for a request. And if anybody made a request, including of their superiors, that didn't include these elements, the request would not be accepted on just on procedural grounds. And it was rocky at first, but very powerful once we dialed it in. Um, Assertions and assessments really key because we get confused about this. Honey, it's hot in here. No, it's not. I'm cold. What's that? An indirect request. It's an assertion. It's a statement that uh, it's, it's an, I'm sorry, it's an assessment. It's a subjective interpretation of a person's experience in the world. It's 72 degrees in here is an assertion. It's testable, provable, verifiable objectively. So there's objective and not. We are assessment creatures. We make interpretations and judgments all the time. They're subjective. We can't not do that. But we get confused between the two of these, and we fight over them. Uh, and the assessment potentially invites a conversation about, rather than, hey, you're a jerk for saying that, why did you say that? I'm interested to know what brought you to that perception in the world. And it gets more interesting when you're talking about politics, not temperature in the room. Then there's this thing called moods, which uh, um, Bob Dunham distinguishes from emotions by saying this is kind of the characteristic stance that you're in in the world that's there before your feet even hit the ground when you get out of bed in the morning. Um, and interestingly, they are tangled up with assessments because the mood you're in will shape the interpretations that you make. And the interpretations that, interpretations that you make will shape the moods that you find yourself in. And very quickly, here's, here's four um, kind of familiar moods that you can look at, uh, look at the two axes. Where do you find yourself on this map, mostly? Is there a characteristic place that you happen to be? I have my guesses about you all. Um, Chauncey Bell observes that resignation is the dominant mood in organizations in North America. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but then think about then walking into that as either a member of the organization, an advisor to the organization, and what becomes possible and how do you shift interpretations about the future through the conversations that people have. Um, what can you do about moods? You can observe them, which is the place to start. You just start noticing, listening, listening for care in particular, and listening to notice what is the mood here. Um, cultivating mood, like a musician, cultivates a capacity in their body to bring forth uh, music or an athlete cultivates capacity or a gardener cultivates the soil. We use that word to create the conditions for growth to happen. Um, and at an advanced level, there's the possibility of orchestrating mood. Well, we see that orchestras do this. We see how music can move mood in a group of people. Um, the possibility here is to find some serenity in what Flor Fernando Flores calls emotional fortitude in the midst of the turmoil that we are living in and will likely live the rest of our lives in. Uh, for me, a part of that has been surrendering prediction addiction, not trying to guess what's going to happen next, but being more of a surfer, moving in the world, paying attention and navigating as best I can. Uh, bong, some sources bong, for bong, those bong. who want to dig deeper, I'm done. Bong, 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 bong. You nailed it. Amazing. Yay. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's very helpful to have the timer in your face. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was going to, uh, Pete and I found a couple of like web timers that I was going to put in my background. I'm like, I don't mm -hmm. know how to get my head out of the way. I'm just going to yeah. do this. That's cool. Um, so we have five minutes of Q&A. Who would like to ask questions? Uh, if you want to surrender the screen so we can see each other. Yep. I've got the yeah. timer going on Q&A. Uh, Mike. Real quick question. I love the two, the two by two diagram. Mm -hmm. Is there a reference? Can I cite it? Can I put it out on Twitter? I mean, I just that was just perfect. It's 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 my graphic from Bob Dunham of the Institute for Generative Leadership. I can send you the graphic. Thank you. Have you posted it online in a post any place that Mike could actually sort of cite and give you some? Um, some no, form? but I can do that if you give me a little time. I'll do that. Cool. I, I think that would be really useful. Um, yeah. Gil. Uh, no, sorry. Nope. Uh, someone else had a question. I have no questions for myself today. Oh, perfect. Um, can you say a little bit about your work with speech act theory? Because there, it's it's sort of notorious and and famous and cool and like it gets at a bunch of it gets at the essence of a bunch of things that make communications much crisper and better. And yet humans have rejected it when it's manifest as software, for example. 
I'm, I'm sorry, about speech act theory? Yeah. Um, Flores and Winograd and a bunch of folks built an application called the Coordinator in the 1980s, which embodied this uh, this uh, uh, t- technology and philosophy for the coordination of organizations. And uh, people embraced it enough that they actually got bought out by Novell um, at, at, at a fair penny. But on the left, where I tried to introduce this thing, people said, this is fascist. This is fascist software. I don't want any part of it. And my sense is that what people felt was fascist was being held to account for their commitments, which is, um, no, uh, to me, is politically neutral in in a in a hierarchical organization with the kind of consequences that Stewart is rejecting. I can see how it would be that way. In the in the work of teams like us who have common values and common concerns, the ability to help us coordinate our actions more clearly, more crisply, without misunderstanding, seems to me a very powerful opportunity. And I've been lobbying these guys to reinvent this thing. Um, um, I, was see a it, I see called, it as a There's a little company called Forspires that showed up and pitched me basically a reinvention of the whole thing. And I'm like, isn't this the coordinator? And they were like, nah, 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 nah. but it actually exactly was. And I don't think they went anyplace. So they, people uh-huh. have tried. There, there have been a few attempts. Nothing has landed yet. But I, I mean, I see in my work, I see all the breakdowns that I'm seeing in organizations and groups. Um, it, well, I don't mean all. A lot of the breakdowns tie back to the failure to attend to these distinctions. We'll come back to that in a sec. Hank, then yeah. Doug C. Uh, yeah, I'd just like to uh, emphasize how much this is a good presentation. Uh, you did say, mm-hmm. uh, Gil, uh, that uh, talking sometimes or may perhaps all the time has to come before action. Uh, mm-hmm. And Dave put stories and narratives uh, in the chat, and I agree, stories and narratives often should come before action. And I'd like to cite uh, Barbara Marx Hubbard, uh, the future exists first in imagination, then in will, then in reality. Mm-hmm. Thanks for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. Doug C. So I remember uh, being on the edge of the coordinator in the 80s. But mm-hmm. the complaint about it was not that it was fascist, although that caught a certain spirit, but that it forced you to label your communication as being a this or a that. Mm-hmm. And that was felt like it got in the way of the fuzzy communication that might be necessary and creative. Sure. And think about all the apps, uh, programs that you used in the 1980s and how, 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 they, how they stack up compared to what we know now. So, yeah, uh, I'm not saying we should do that, but these these ways of interacting and coordinating among people have great power. It's very, that's, and that's an, that's, that's an assessment. Right? Yeah. I'm really ambivalent about this because I just, I heard a guy saying that his interactions with chat GPT were making his interactions with his staff better because he was learning how to be more precise about what he was requesting of his people, which is very mm-hmm. interesting. Like, cause we don't, mm-hmm. we don't, we don't achieve that kind of precision very often. We take things for granted. Uh, yeah. Stuart. Yeah, uh, pardon me, just to tie the loose end, um, I also worked with Fernando in the late 1980s and his work was informative in a number of ways of, of, of mine. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, for, for um, couples relationships, he had this uh, body of work called the, I think 10 dom- domains of permanent concern, which are actually included in the book of agreement in a model of a, a, a couple's agreement. Um, so thank you, Gil. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Awesome. We have uh, eight seconds left. Uh, and so I think our, I think our, our well, then I'll, I'll, I'll just echo Jerry. My experience with chat GPT is that if I use these distinctions with chat GPT, I get far better results than if I don't. Love that. Um, can you drop the screen share for a sec? Or yeah. So you can see each other. Or permanently. Um, Excellent. Uh, first, is there anybody else who wanted to step in with a five minute you? If not, we will switch into more conversational mode, but I just wanted to see if anybody else showed up with one. No? Okay, good. Doug? Uh, you're asking for another voluntary five minute? Yes. Okay. So this is kind of impromptu, obviously. Uh, you want to go for What I want to talk about is. Um, uh, the book I published recently called Garden World Politics, which is a reaction to climate change. What's interesting is how I got there is in the 80s, I started doing interviews with what people wanted. And what came out clearly, despite politics, 
was they wanted to live in a community. They wanted safety for their children. They wanted good education. Wow, a lot of things that were in common. So I started a book called The 80% Solution. It is the 80% of people that would vote for a solution if it was offered. And of course, it wasn't. While working on that, uh, climate change came along. And what I was struck by is that the climate change was not being dealt with in the same way by the values that people cared about. So there was no image of where the climate work was trying to go. Uh, and it seems to me it's awfully hard to do progressive work if you don't have a shared image of what you're trying to do. Uh, and so coming out of my own background in many ways, I thought of the idea that if we put food production and habitat living in the same space, uh, we could make really attractive uh, communities uh, like the arts and crafts movement of the late 1880s. Uh, so I've been working on that with the idea, in fact, that the, the, any solution to climate change requires that people get fed and housed. So why don't we make that an, an aesthetic project as well as a practical one in order to make people comfortable with where that can be going? So that's what I've been working on. Uh, and it's been uh, thrilling and exciting. And uh, I recommend to everybody that you write down your ideas. It's really helpful. Awesome. Thank you. I'm going to reset and go to Q and A. Um, thank you very much. That was a, that was really great. Uh, questions, thoughts. Um, I, I'll jump in first, uh, Doug. Um, uh, the Great Transformation is one of my favorite books in part because he very nicely describes what life was like before the Industrial Revolution changed everything, and uh, beforehand, like. People, like everything didn't have a price. Uh, we didn't have salaries. Uh, people did work as work needed to be done. We shared resources. And this idea that, that you know, we could grow, we, we grew our own food a lot. It was, it's called householding. We shared a lot uh, with, each, with each other. That's called reciprocity or redistribution, et cetera. And we have so adopted um, the, the, the industrial modernist civilized framing that the first of the SDGs is no poverty. And we, we, we insist that people have money in order to not starve. And it's like, uh, we could do better than that. And I think Garden World is, is an example of that. It's like, hey, people need food and shelter for starters. And we have abundance. And, and sort of going back to what AI is doing for us, one of, the, one of the funny, one of the better named visions of where this is going is called FALC, Fully Automated Luxury Communism. And basically, it, it comes from the idea that um, it, what, if machines, if we do this right, machines can do all the work and make abundance, and then we can sort of uh, enjoy uh, leisure life as as happy communists together. Sorry for the really long question comment, Doug, but. Um... Well, I, I think that the abundance view is not going to happen. I think that we're going to see major losses in uh, arable land and in food, and we're going to have to live with it. And some people will have the opportunity of creating garden worlds, and many people will, will not. And that's the world that we're going to have to live in. I have the, the view that garden world, while it has a certain kind of nostalgic quality to it, of the old world, the world we have lost, um, I really think that high tech plays a role in it in terms of coordinating across communities and providing information on pr production, uh, resources, labor, and st stuff like that, and hopefully to come up with a new model of how we distribute wealth. So there's going to be a lot of emergence in any case, but let's put it into the most positive scenario we can, which has got to be an image of where we're going. And the great thing about Garden World is it's safe. It's, uh, and it's safe for artists, it's safe for children, it's safe for pay pets. And kind of the way we're talking about this and what you're presenting is an illustration of agreements on means but not ends or ends but not means and a bunch of the stuff that we were talking about in the other five minute use in some interesting ways. Uh, Gil, did you want to jump in? Um, yeah, I, uh, the, the, the food and housing provocation is an important one. It's really, it's really where I started my sustainability work 50 years ago. 
looking at urban agriculture, rooftop agriculture, uh, permeable cities. Seven, you know, seventy percent of Los Angeles is paved, hardscape. Um, Los Angeles had the, the rainfall there is half of the water needs of the city, but most of the water goes down the drain, down the sewers, out to out to sewage treatment plants with energy load, and out to the sea. Uh, the possibility of cities being living systems that capture water, grow food, feed people, cycle waste is rich, and it can be beautiful. And to Doug's point. Um, one of the most powerful adopters we've seen of, of so-called green buildings is to have people step inside them and feel how differently they feel in a building that's well-designed and has clean air and adaptive to their bodies. Um, and so, you know, the vision of what's possible is great. The tangible experience with what's possible is really powerful. Because I thought Kenneth Boulding said this, but I can't find a site to him, so it might be me, that existence is proof of the possible. If you can one show me something had, that's on the ground, you can't say it's impossible anymore. One of the people who had a big, big influence on me was Frederick Law Olmsted, who mm -hmm. did Central Park in New York. He did the Stanford campus. He did Niagara Falls. A lot of things. Golden uh, always Park, from the point of view. He Golden created Gate. those falls? That's impressive. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, he created the entrance uh, in to, and the same for Yosemite. Um, and he had the view that nature could be a cleaning process for human nature and that it could be beautiful and that we should build in, in that view. Awesome. Thank you. Looks like we're out of uh, out of question time. I love how this sounds a little bit like the prime minister's question time, which is always entertaining in the UK. Why don't we do question time? Chicken shit. It, uh, yeah, it's kind of it's like fun. You could you could heckle, hoot, and holler. Uh, Stuart, were you going to do a, uh, another question for for Doug? Uh, you're muted. Uh, <clears throat> quasi question, more a, more a brief comment on on you know all the presentations, um, uh, if I may. So I, I woke up at three in the morning and I had this book on my pile. All right. And, and I just want to read it. It's called Forgiving. It's a it's a it's a 80 page book. <clears throat> it's by Peter Russell, uh, who I'm sure people here are familiar with. Forgiving humanity, <clears throat> how the most innovative species became the most dangerous. The curse of exponential change by Peter Russell. Wow. And, in, and in some ways, what Peter has put down is um, it, it's an analog to, to, to the slideshow that Ken shared a while back about how did we get here? But he talks about, you know, exponential change that's coming down the pike. When we talk about emergence, we really don't know. And, and listening to presentations, it's so clear, and comments and citations in the chat, it's so clear to me that, that you know, we kind of know what to do. And in some ways we have the technology to actually do it, to be taking action. But there are so many things that are uncoordinated. Um, and I, I don't mean, I don't mean a, a very, very specific plan, but I think we touch on the edges of what might need to happen to go forward. You know, Gil talked about, you know, the moods and the internal stuff. I talked a little about, you know, um, collaboration. Um, Doug talked about garden world, which is kind of a central piece of the puzzle, you know, as we, as, as, as we go forward. Um, and Jerry, the technology and AI, I mean, here we do, we hit, we hit, you know, the essential pieces of what needs to happen going forward. Um, and it's, um, you know, back to Al Gore's statement, you know, denial's not just a river in Egypt. I love that. Quoting dire straits, I believe. <laughs> cool so i just needed to i needed to say that but the book was a kind of a wonderful read for giving humanity um what a what a great title so thanks for the taking the air time mm -hmm. that's good um so i think um uh, several things i think we're slipping into conversation time which is great we can talk about any and all of these things unless somebody else wants to step in with um a five minute you uh hey welcome to the call i think this is your first call i wanted to say hi um, and thank you for being here. If you're, if you'd like to say hi to the group, uh, feel free to step in, but no pressure. Um, but thank you for being here. We don't usually use this format. This is kind of our first time doing it this frenzied way. Uh, and we've been working a lot on actually slowing down our conversations, but I, 
I, I don't know. I found this pretty fun. Um, but uh, let me know if you'd like to, to, to jump in. Um, and if not, let's go back to Ken, who is uh, in the queue. Thank you. Doug, you seem to have your hand up, not raised on, on here. Did you want to say something before I go? Doug, see. Well, I have something that's more than a minute. <laughs> so I, I think I'll hold right. off. It's something that we published in Pete's magazine uh, yesterday or today uh, that, uh, that okay. responds to this issue of uh, whether we're going to survive or not. Um, so I'll interject what I was going to say. Uh, Gil talked about coordinating action. The other thing we do in language is coordinate language. And I excuse me, coordinate coordinations. And I wasn't clear mm -hmm. on this for a while. So I, I'd asked somebody who was teaching a, a course on this and they said, well, okay, wolves have language and wolves can coordinate their actions. So a wolf pack can take down an elk that no single elk could, no single wolf could take down on its own. That's the coordination of action. But what they can't do is say, that was awesome. Let's be back here tomorrow at four o'clock. We'll do it all over again. That's the coordination of coordinations, which is a different level and a different order of magnitude that humans can do that other animals do not. And I just wanted to throw that in there as um, something really important to pay attention to, because what Stuart just pointed to is we have all these, we have plenty of, of solutions for our problems, but we lack a coordination of coordinations. So sure, we can coordinate action to, to solve lots of problems, but we, at the moment, are failing to coordinate our coordinations around making that happen in a way that is coherent. So end of, of rant, thank you. And then just to add to that, like, and Sue, when, you, when you're gonna bare your fangs, you gotta pull your teeth, you gotta show more teeth and bark louder. Like, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, that's the, the judging wolf. Um, <laughs> it's, it's the coach wolf, like, like the coach wolf, the, right. Exactly. By the way, it turns out that alpha wolf may be a, an error. Um, maybe it may be a human projection onto wolfness. Do you mean that wolves don't behave socially in that way? Or do you mean that alpha animal is not a thing? Um, I mean, a claim that alpha animal is not a thing the way that we understand it to be. Huh. Uh, that's interesting. I, that's, I, I, that's, that's, the, that's the way that ethologists who live in monarchies would look at animals. Yeah, a different way to say it is we understand alpha wolves the way we, we think humans are. Yeah. And we use each to, to um, explain the other, which is a mutually reinforcing set of fantasies, perhaps. Which are, you know, back in my little framework of assessments, these are interpretations that we're making based on who we are, who we've been, what we live in, and our interpretations of other people's interpretations of their interpretations of our interpretations. It's a tangled mess, and it's really powerful to be attentive to it and to start to tease it apart a little bit. Um, I took a local training that involved horses, learned a whole bunch of really interesting things, including that horses appear to be mat matriarchal. <clears throat> so the senior mare is in charge. And in a herd, everybody's paying attention to what she's doing. And if she changes her breathing or looks up, everybody will stop and look up and look around because mm -hmm. uh, she's in charge. And she leads from behind. So if the herd is running, mm -hmm. she won't be out in front leading the herd. She'll be in back. Mm -hmm. uh, very, very interesting dynamics. And again, amateur interpretation of said dynamics. Here's an article, The Myth of the Alpha Wolf. Thanks, Pete. Uh, Stuart, go ahead. Yeah, just to pick up and provide a little context and background. You know, Gil has mentioned Fernando Flores' work a number of times. I don't know how many people here are familiar with it. But um, Fernando Flores at 26 was the finance minister of Chile and then was imprisoned um, under, uh, imprisoned and freed by um, um, Amnesty International and came to the United States um, and developed this consultancy. And he took these amazing um, Chilean intellectuals uh, and they wrote papers ontologically unpacking all of the phenomena that are critical in society, i.e. relationships, commerce, um, communication, and just really drill, drill, drill down into the bottom of these things so you could understand them. It was just an amazing series of papers and beautiful to study with him. And in some ways, that's why, you know, when you look at the, the language that we use and the conversations we have, um, it's just so important 
to be able to drill down into it and understand what is really being said and what is not being said and where does it come from. So just a little bit of my my two minute my my two minute overview of the work of of Fernando. Not to mention you know the software because I was on the I was on the coordinator too, uh, 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 Gil in the early uh, mm -hmm. late nineteen eighties. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. This, this is probably Fernanda's most yeah. yeah. This is probably Fernanda's most accessible book. Understanding computers, cognition, disclosing the world's trust. Those are all really heavy duty academics. This is a little bit um, more accessible, so uh, I recommend it. Very accessible, and disclosing new worlds is very much of relevance to the kind of conversations we've been having here these last few years. Super cool. So where does that leave us? At the top of the hour. So, so Can I try my longer uh, two minute rant? Um, hold on a second. Let's go a little, uh, hold that thought, Doug. Let's go a little bit uh, meta on what we've just been talking about. Go ahead, Stuart. Yeah, so where does that leave us? It's a great question, Jerry. So one of the things that came out um, is the notion that we kind of know what to do and we need a coordinator of coordinators or something like that. Um, and that would be a, you know, a most interesting um, project. Not that I'm saying that this group ought to do the project, but I think it's something that's, that's needed. And boy, when you think about the potential grunt work involved with that, what a perfect project for AI. <laughs> to to amass all of the 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 positive kind of movements that are bubbling up all over the place all over the world right now because you know we're not the only, obviously we're not the only people um in this conversation there are thoughtful people everywhere that are thinking about um where we are in the trajectory that we're on so just you know some food for thought Thanks, Stuart. One of the organizing energies of OGM is very much, I hadn't thought about it in this language, but very much about coordinating human activity so that we can solve things together and make a better world. Um, and not, and almost, almost in an opposite way to what the coordinator software was doing back in the day of trying to achieve clarity and crispness of, of communications. Um, but I'll, I'll just put that in and go to Mike. This is going to sound like a bit of a rant as well, but I, I guess I, I am a huge believer in the power of coordination and the wisdom of crowds and the ability to find new insights by getting enough minds to share in a, in a safe way. But Nelson's first law of online discussions is that the people with the least to say have the most time to say it. And that can be incredibly disruptive. I mean, in a group this size, it would take one person to kind of destroy the whole ethos and to get us off track and, and to, to really destroy any chance of taking our words into action. And so I, I, I wonder if anybody has seen a good book on, on how to, to handle this. I'm, I'm, I'm particularly feeling this because this last 10 days, we've seen a whole flurry of really sad things happening with the internet and internet policy. And they're all over the place. I mean, one of them, a new study on, on how good reads, I mean, this wonderful place where millions of people share their observations on the books they're reading and how much they love them. Well, that's now become an attack platform. People write a new book and thousands of people will write one star reviews and just mm. troll the authors. I mean, it's Yelp has also suffered a little bit of this. On the policy side, we have an, just an, a ridiculous new uh, court ruling in Louisiana saying that the Biden administration can't talk to the social media platforms because that would imply censorship. Well, again, it's one wacko crazy judge using legal theories that nobody agrees with. And he's getting a huge amount of publicity 
and agencies throughout the federal government are backing away from meetings that they already had planned to highlight ways in which the private sector could take action to make the internet a better place and get rid of the trolls and get rid of the, the hate speech. I mean, it's, again, it's, it's one or two people can just cause havoc. And the latest one, the latest one, which should be making everybody in America livid is that our former president, the orange guy, doxed President Obama. He put out on, on his social media platform, he said, here's where Barack Obama lives. And one of the people who was in the Capitol on January 6th and hadn't been apprehended showed up in Obama's neighborhood with two mm. semi-automatic weapons and Molotov mm. cocktails. Mm. Ah! How do we how do we stop the trolls? And I, I even though this is a huge problem, I have seen no good discussion on how to maintain the spirit of community, particularly online, where you can't take somebody aside and say, "Hey, Bill, you're being a jerk." I rant over, but this is a serious problem. And if we're ever going to have international peace, we need to start with uh, small groups. <laughs> Mike, thank you for bringing those those recent events into the conversation. They they really are saddening, um, and and I thought you were going to mention the the continued gradual destruction and erosion of Twitter, uh, but we could just add that add that to the pile. Um, well, how about the Supreme Court case where the guy who is named as he's this is the gay guy who wants to be married didn't even he exists but he's married a woman never approached the woman it's like doesn't matter we're going to make this a test case anyway I, I i'm sorry but for me scotus has lost all legitimacy i mean they clearly they're they're corrupt they're 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 out of out of bounds here and i don't know what we can do about it but man i'm just so disappointed and angry about the whole thing so i think the organization that brought that suit was created in order to bring that suit and win that case yeah. And then yep. they invented their story, yep. and that seems that works. That's that, that. I didn't think that's how the law worked, but yep. and, oh, the you got... and, and the organization is associated with Clarence Thomas's wife. Oh, perfect. Sweet. Uh, if you have a, an article or whatever, please post it in the chat. Let's go to Gil and Stewart. Uh, um, so, Mike, your rant is over, but it's not over in my body. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> um, you know, Nelson's law is maybe handled by Metca Metcalf's timer. So there's that. Um, God, where was I going with this? Um, it's not a single crazy person, obviously. It's a coordinated, well-funded strategic campaign to destroy the, 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 what Doris Lessing called the substance of we feeling in society and to politicize everything and trollize everything. And it's not, you know, it's not one guy, it's a lot of money and it's a lot of fake humans and so forth designed you know, to do what it's doing. Where was I going with this? Um, um, well, I'll I'll come back. To, I had a point before before my you're fired up got me fired up, and so uh, memories wiped. On to the next person. No worries. Thanks, Gil. It'll come back to you. Uh, screw it, then Doug C. Yeah. So, um, thinking about this and doing a little bit of writing about this, um, there's always going to be a marginal criminal element, okay? And it's a question of how big it is. There's always going to be some marginal criminal element that's going to need policing of some kind, whatever that might look like in the future. You know, this ties in, obviously, to um, reinventing um, what police do, right? The other piece is, and I think it's so important, and it picks up on the what Gil talked about earlier is the dominant mood in the company, in the country. Um, and in the world, perhaps, a lot of people in resignation out there, total resignation, and that's how they become radicalized. Um, Colin Powell understood this, you know, he thought the way to stop the radicalization in the terrorist world was to provide, provide funding and a social safety net. Obviously, mm -hmm. the, the politics uh, didn't enable him um, to do that. Um, but I think, and this goes back to someone who talked about, you know, uh, 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 <laughs> we're headed towards a communistic world or could be, and that is, you know, a social safety net for everyone. 
as part of a re potential reorganization. Why? Because if people have a social safety net, they the, the tendency is not so much to become radicalized. You know, everybody's looking for an ax to grind somebody to blame whose fault is it? And um, and 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 people um, without some level of education, re-education will resort to to violent means. Um, so that's just that's just, you know, my two cents on this this cosmology that we're talking about. Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug, so, and also Doug, if you want, Doug C, sorry. Um, and also, Doug, if you want to do your two minute rant, this is a good moment for that. Yeah, this is this is going to be it. And I'm going to make oh, a, good. Very challenging, a very challenging statement, which is that if we look at the work of uh, Joseph Tainter, Jared Diamond, and Arnold Toynbee, they all say all civilizations collapse because they cannot manage complexity sufficiently to the kind of complexity we're actually creating. So I have the view that human humanity might be organized such that we create uh, lots of new babies and lots of new ideas and relationships. And the two together weave a net that's so close that, that new motion becomes very hard uh, until we are basically are in a place where we're stuck. So the proposal is that in fact, all civilizations do this, period. Now, what that suggests is that the sweet spot to live in is not at the beginning or the end of a civilization, but in the middle, where things feel open, creativity is rewarded, the music and the arts and science are doing well, uh, but it's not going to last the whole cycle. And that we, there's a lot of evidence, are at the end of a, of a cycle for this civilization. And the story. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. Um, Mr. Carranza. Oh, I'd just like to welcome Jose. If I can. Hey, Jose, how are you doing? And, and Pei. Um, uh, we welcomed Pei a little while ago. Morning, guys. That's it. Sorry, oh. I'm enjoying, enjoying listening, but uh, actively working simultaneously. So apologize for uh, being incognito here. Hey, no thanks problem. for being here. I'm off incognito and going back to incognito. Just wanted to um, slow um, some space and say, hey, I've never seen these names before. Hello. Um, Thank you for doing that. Um, Stuart, take your time in stepping in. Yeah, so um, thank you, Doug. Um, I didn't find it provocative at all because uh, I don't think there's any questions in my mind that the emergent uh, 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 vectors are going to collapse us at some point in time. You know, absent some unknown thing, but that's that's where we're headed. And I just wanted to say that everything I say is also in service of, um, so when we do hit the fan, when the civilization that we know uh, and are living in, you know, does in fact collapse, when the internet shuts down, when the food shortages um, start to emerge, when climate creates massive disruption, um, from my own work, um, there is something else after conflict. There's some resolution. There's something new. It's cyclical, you know, like the stock market goes up and down. Governments rise and fall. Um, things work out for a while and we're very happy. And then, and then they, they, they collapse. So um, I just wanted to kind of, uh, uh, you know, kind of punctuate that in some way. The vectors are all pointing um, in that direction. And, and Peter Russell certainly validates that um, uh, in his book. So thank you, Doug. Mm -hmm. What's that, please? 
Yeah, so um, thank you to, to both Doug and, and Stuart on that one, because that leads me to to question, how invested are we in a system that we know we're coll it's collapsing? And how much time and effort do we spend worrying both about how it's falling apart and um, and trying to either correct it or address it rather than on building something new. Um, and is there is our attention towards the thing that's falling apart and losing sight of the fact that once it continues to follow down where we know it's going to follow, um, that if we're tied to it and we're bound to it, that we will go with it. And if we jump to something new, to creating something new, does that provide us with a new, um, a new focus, one that isn't tied to a cycle that is a, a downward trend? Are there other people here who wrestle with the question of can the present system, and let's maybe sort of call it capitalism plus other things, be rescued or fixed? Or do we need to somehow switch, shift, wipe it out to a some new post-capitalist society is that a are you wrestling with that all the time who's who's we jerry uh people in this room mm. I, i'm i'm being very specific about the we this time like like people here so dave mike gill yeah and, um and Pete, uh, my Frank, my view is that is that is that capitalism which i've come to hyphenate as capitalism uh has structural defects uh, that none of the reform efforts on the on the landscape today are addressing in at their root. Not you know ecological, social, responsible, conscious, you know stakeholder, et cetera. All all fine things, but none of them are getting to the root of the problem. It's band aids on a pig. Sorry, um, Jerry. Do you mind restating your question? I, I'm not sure I understood. I think my my question was who uh, are any of us kind of fretting about this meta question of can capitalism as a placeholder for the present system be fixed or healed or do we need to shift to some other kind of system and if so if so what and lots of people I think like the majority of people here were like yep yep me uh, does that help so does the raising of the hand mean I think that the system is screwed and we have to do something else or does it mean I think the system is recoverable I don't know it means that they're wrestling with that particular okay okay it's, I, the, I, it's the wrestling not where they stand on one side or the other I didn't ask for a one way or the other kind okay, of okay uh, thank you I wasn't sure I understood which we could do totally yeah thanks Jose thanks for the anybody clear. not re anybody not wrestling with that question yeah. Well, everybody's got a different version of it I I wouldn't yeah. use the yeah. word capitalism because I I think really free markets could actually work here so, um, yeah. but but it's it's, 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 where, it's where politics and capitalism collide and, and lead to markets that don't work and people who are uninformed and uneducated I mean there's a whole range of things that need to be fixed and capitalism is just one facet of it so I I I, I, I think you need to broaden your question, Jerry. <laughs> but yeah. it certainly is. It certainly is uh, uh, something every one of us should be thinking about. And I, I have, and I have not seen, as Gil said. I mean, I, I, I don't see people who take on the fundamental problems that are causing what all of us see as a as a failure. I'm sharing out the, my collection of variants of capitalism, and then I have a subset called dysfunctional variants of capitalism, like corporate yeah. crony disaster, and disaster capitalism would lead us to the shock doctrine, which is Naomi Klein's book about this, you know, using crises mm -hmm. to catalyze change, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then there are also some more heartening uh, uh, compassionate capitalism. Do you, have, do you have surveillance capitalism in there? Oh, of course. Okay. Uh, feral capitalism. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, I have found a whole lot um, uh, of variants of capitalism. So here's articles about surveillance capitalism, mm -hmm. and here's yeah. the, the here's surveillance capitalism, and it's under dysfunctional variants of capitalism. So I will I will actually send a link to this thought right here. I'll put this in the chat uh, and attach it to today's call, and go to Pete, who's in. Wait, the Jerry, where's your thought for the uh, viable alternatives to capitalism? Uh, I will uh, share that as well. 
Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Pete, go ahead. I, I really appreciate Mike's uh, Mike's suggestion is the wrong word, but uh, uh, observation that it's it's actually more complicated and complex. Um, thanks, Mike. Um, I, I wanted to say um, uh, that the the way you asked it, Jerry, it kind of sounded like an either or, you know, can we fix capitalism or is something new going to have to emerge? And I think of it differently. Um, uh, I think I think it's clear that the current system is unsustainable, in, in, insustainable, and and we can either work to make the collapse and renewal of that uh, uh, softer landing or harder landing. So um, the so so to restate that, um, I think change is inevitable, essentially collapse is inevitable. And then what can we do to make that either, um, you know, lower impact or higher impact? Um, and, and impacts will be, you know, probably millions of deaths and, and displacements and, you know, um, pain and suffering. And so how can we lessen that is the way I think of it. Um, Pete, I, I like that a lot. And thank you for the reframe. I think my, my, the way I posed my question assumed a whole bunch of things that I don't even necessarily hold. <clears throat> and one of my framings for this is I think we're we're busy developing the next two stacks, one stack, I don't know, but the, the current stack is democracy, capitalism, money, and a bunch of other things. And the current organizational stack is corporation, B, you know, uh, C Corps and nonprofits and a couple other little things. And I'm I'm curious about what is the next societal stack if the software metaphor isn't just too abrasive there. But but then we come into new. Jerry, can you show can you show us the current stack? Uh, sure. So um, today's societal stack is uh, the American dream, free markets, neoclassical economics, neoliberalism, possessive individualism, systemic racism, uh, the Washington consensus, which involves uh, a bunch of sort of neoliberal beliefs, et cetera, et cetera. That seems to be that that's my my best uh, explanation of today's stack. That's a that that but that conflates causes and effects. I, I would just mm -hmm. be happy to get the operating system right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, yeah. and 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 there's a bunch of people working on what is our next OS, et cetera. That's a that's an interesting question as well. And these things are all neighbor questions, and there's a lot of people doing sincere and deep work on this. And I'd love to figure out which are the best of these. And 150 years from now, we're going to be celebrating the hundredth anniversary of the one that that took over. Um, but, but it'd be nice to detect it and help it take over right now. Um, Doug, I've got you mentally in the queue, but I've got Dave, Hank, and Stuart ahead of you, and we're running out of time for today's call. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, thanks. I apologize if my internet's too late for this, so let me know if I should give up. Uh, I, you, you start, you're coming in fast, and you're... Um, just but yeah, I, I feel like... All right, I'll stop the video. Um, no, I, I find myself thinking about this a lot because there is definitely a group of people who are, we have to have collapse and then there'll be something. And I'm kind of hoping we don't have to have collapse, but there'll be change because change is kind of normal. And and I was thinking about it as I was visiting Nantucket last week, you know, the home of the whaling industry and, you know, what, what saved the whales, right? It was like, well, it was digging for oil in Pennsylvania, right? It was, it was that evolution to a new thing. And so you know, I kind of think Stuart's on the right path, which is we need a new form of collaboration, right? All of capitalism is the way we organize our work. You know, we need to be able to be better at collaboration. So can we can we shift to a new generation of collaboration quickly enough that we don't destroy the country and don't slow, destroy the world in the meantime? Uh, just to add a story to that, John Jacob Astor made his fortune uh, in part on beaver pelts because top hats were made of beaver, beaver fur. What changed that was one day the Prince of Wales wore a black silk top hat and voila, from one day to the next fashion shifted, silk was in and all of a sudden the silk trade went up and the beavers were like, damn, we were almost extinct. Um, uh, Hank. Beavers are known to say damn a lot. That's true. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> That's why they pay Ken Homer the big bucks. <laughs> Okay, uh, thanks for your question, Jerry, because it's something I'm thinking about quite a lot. And uh, my version of the question is the following. 
after all the money and the time and the human energy spent on addressing major societal issues, huge amounts of money, time, and energy, for example, in addressing the 17 SDGs, why aren't we getting better results? Can capitalism or some other economic system help us get a better return on the investment of our collective intelligence and our collective tax money on that. And uh, the Oracy Lab, which I've talked about earlier in, in various calls, is going to do a series of uh, sessions on questions like this later in the summer. Uh, at the moment, we only have Europeans I'm looking to get some Japanese as well, but it'd be great to have some Americans, uh, anyone in the OGM as well, to take part in these discussions. Where can we get more details? Uh, send me a note on WhatsApp or on uh, our internet. I'll put the... Uh, So um, one of the things that informs me is my introductory economics course, which is my undergraduate major. And, and the thing that jumped out at me was, quote, we are in a tertiary economy, which means that um, there are so many choices people have as a result of marketing and sales and packaging. <laughs> and the cost of goods sold is approximately two thirds of the value of items produced. Now, as someone who at that moment in time was thinking about being an efficiency expert, whatever that meant, it was like, what the fuck? <laughs> this is insane. We're wasting all these resources. And yet <clears throat> we are, you know, kind of brainwashed in, in, in the sense of, you know, luxury brands. Growing up in New York City, you know, people gave you the once over. What brands were you wearing? What was your grooming like? You know, and that was, and you could feel it, you could sense it. Um, and, and that's that's kind of, uh, you know, um, why current capitalism in some ways um, <clears throat> needs to be um, rejiggered or re-educated to get that frame of reference out of our, out of our minds in mm -hmm. some ways, um, to actually kind of um, recalibrate the real essential values because everything today seems to be analyzed through that lens. I've said this before, but um, you know, just this, this graphic uh, of the fact that two thirds of the cost of goods, when you think about resource use, it's just insane in some ways. Thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug, I've got you in the queue, but Ken has got to bounce in a second and I suspect he might have a poem for us. Yeah, I, I listened to this conversation, I think, only God can save us. So I have a poem called Jesus <laughs> Incognito. Nice. It's a poem called uh, Jesus Incognito by Allison Luterman. <clears throat> Don't tell anyone, but I love Jesus. I love his big, dark Jewish eyes. So full of suffering soul. Like an unemployed poet and his thick, sensuous Jewish lips and his kinky, curly hair, just like mine uncontrollable despite conditioners and the way he always argues everyone and he will go to hell for love he's just like that buddhist god avokiteshvara the immense the, the emanation of compassion except his name is easier to pronounce when you're in trouble it's hard to remember to yell for avokiteshvara but oh jesus arises naturally every time a crazy hot dog a crazy driver hot dogs pass me on the freeway i know i should say the shema when i'm about to die but will I be able to remember the Hebrew at the right time? I don't want to die saying, oh shit. I'd like to leave my body consciously like a Tibetan Lama, sitting in full lotus, my head turned towards where I'll reincarnate next. But let's be realistic. I probably don't have time to meditate enough to get enlightened in however many years I have left. Jesus seems easier. All you have to do is love everyone. Well, love is the key word here. Sometimes the more you try to love people, the more you hate them. 
maybe it would be better to try not to love people and then watch the love force its way out of you like grass through cement. Anything is better than organized religion. Plus, I don't like singing in churches, all those hymns in major keys. I don't think religion should sound so triumphant. It should be humble and aware of the basic incurable pathos of the human condition. And in a minor key, and sung in, in an ancient mysterious language like Sanskrit or Hebrew. Is it okay if I want to love Jesus but not be Christian? I could just open my heart and give away my possessions. It's not that different from being a Buddhist after all, except for history of witch burning, the Inquisition, subjugation, rape, pillage of indigenous peoples over the world, not to mention 20 centuries of vicious anti-Semitism. That's a lot to overlook. To get back to being a baby born among the animals to a Jewish mother, Miriam, and that other Mary, the sexy one. Jesus, I don't believe you died a virgin. I think you needed to taste everything humid, inhabit the whole mess. Blood, shit, flies, regret, envy, why me, I owe you, and all the other bodhisattvas and sages, and newborn babies, and a debt of thanks for agreeing to come back and marry yourselves to our painful predicament again and again. And I do thank you, bowing to the infinite directions. See y'all next week. And thank you. That was just pitch perfect. Somehow this works out. I don't know what it is. Very mysterious it's, process. It's, lo- it's, like ter- <laughs> it's like tarot readings. It's like, wait. It is. Okay. It is. It kind of worked. All right. I got to run. Bye-bye. Thanks, Ken. Uh, Doug C., you may have the last word today. Uh, you're muted. Uh, oh, he's got to go. Never mind. He's gone. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested in feedback on the five minute university uh, experience and adventure. Love it. Love it. Good. We should do this again. Um, I'm interested in collecting up who else would like to do five minute universities. And one way to do it is to batch them up. And as soon as we have four, uh, mm-hmm. volunteers we do another session drop it in the queue uh, I could force the dates I could do something else don't know I think three was exactly the right number by mistake three was good okay yeah I think four would actually I mean three you can then dive into a discussion about all three mm-hmm. if you did four I think the first two would kind of blur interesting and we did have four because uh, Doug sort of stepped in with his uh, impromptu mm-hmm. one um, which wasn't a full it was three minutes long which is fine which would work actually pretty well but I, I think you're right like three is a digestible usable stimulating mm-hmm. number uh, Gil um, for people who've been wondering about doing this this is not just great for the people getting get, getting to absorb the five-minute mm-hmm. university but it's a kick to present it and to really force yeah. yourself to focus it down and be clean it's a really great exercise I was yeah. nervous about it and I'm I'm glad I did it. You rocked it. Um, thank you for doing that. And thank you for using Obsidian Slides. That was my first viewing of somebody using Obsidian Slides. Yeah, there's a lot of formatting capacities and so forth that I haven't gotten to yet. But I just figured, you know, in, in the spirit of doing this, I just dive in and see what happened. And, and Pete, my, thanks for the suggestion of slides.com. And my intention is to re-record the one I did and post it on YouTube openly and uh, et cetera, et cetera, because I, I'm hoping it's useful. So on from there. Um, Cool. See everybody. Uh, I'm, oh, uh, sorry, quickly. Um, I'm probably not going to be able to make the next three uh, calls, maybe the next two calls. I'm going to be in in, uh, Baja, California and traveling. I'm not sure. I'll figure out the dates and post it on the Mattermost, but we might need uh, someone to step in uh, and play with the format next Thursday. Uh, Certainly next Thursday, uh, it would be great to have someone who'd like to, to host and play with the format. Uh, we can figure that out uh, on chats, but please uh, consider that. We can handle that, and we have no objection to you coming in from Baja. Excellent. I will see everybody soon. And Bye, all. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Bye.